Hello and welcome to my channel where I'll be telling you all kinds of strange stories ranging from true crime to some much less believable although just as fascinating tales. For today's video we have the poisonous tale of Masumi Hayashi. Listen in and see what you think. Masumi Hayashi was born on the 22nd of July 1961 in Japan. She was a shy child and someone who preferred her own company a lot of the time and her parents worried that she would never marry. However, Masumi did meet someone, an older divorcee named Kenji, with whom she struck up a relationship and eventually married. The couple had four children together and although Kenji may not have been who Masumi's parents imagined when they thought of her son-in-law, all seemed to be well. After a few years, Masumi, Kenji and their four children moved to the Sonobi district of Wakayama, around 340 miles or 550 kilometres west of Tokyo. Sonobi had been a pretty, quaint little village that contained a lot of farmers and which was surrounded by rice fields. However, by the time the late 1980s rolled around, this picturesque, quiet village began to grow. Farmers were happy to sell off their land for housing. The houses built in Sonobe were large and spacious and many would see them as status symbols. They were ideal for commuters travelling into the larger city of Wakayama. Masumi and Kenji's house was one of the largest in the area, with a landscaped garden and enough room for all the children to grow. This all sounds lovely for Masumi and her family, a new place to live, good money, and a big, impressive house. Unfortunately, the Hayashi family were not well liked in the area. They didn't try to get involved in village events, and they made no effort to make friends with their neighbours. And this wasn't just the adults either. Masumi, introverted as ever, actively told her children not to join in with anything, and not to get to know anyone. They weren't even allowed to play outside with other local children. It's not that the Hayashis didn't have any friends, they did, only all those friends came from outside the area and these were the only people Masumi seemed to have any interest in spending time with. She gave the impression that she was better than everyone else and that they didn't deserve her friendship or even to make her acquaintance. As ever has been and probably always will be the case, in a wealthy neighbourhood like Sonobi, the neighbours, with little information to go on, started to spread gossip. They speculated as to just how the Hayashi family had enough money to pay for everything, and in particular, how they had enough money to pay for their lovely house. Since Masumi was so unfriendly and the others were kept away from the locals, there were no answers to these questions. No answers that were immediately forthcoming anyway. As far as anyone knew, and it wasn't much knowledge at all, Masumi was an insurance salesperson and Kenji didn't work at all, although he had previously owned a termite extermination business and been self-employed. The mystery of the Hayashis and their strange behaviour and where their money came from would continue. Much like many other small Japanese communities, Sonobe held a summer festival each year. This would be arranged by the locals and was a chance for everyone to come together to enjoy good food, listen to music, play games and take part in a variety of other fun activities. These festivals were called Matsuri and it was something that people looked forward to all year round. By 1998 the Matsuri in Sonobi had been taking place for a number of years and there was a committee in place to oversee the arrangements. The head of this committee was a 64-year-old man named Takatoshi Taninaka and the deputy chairman was a 53-year-old Takaki Tanaka. These two men, along with their highly experienced and organised committee, had all the preparations for the summer festival in hand in plenty of time, preferring to get things arranged with time to spare. Something they liked to do to ensure everyone felt involved was to send out invitations. These invitations would go to every household in the village and they would contain vouchers 
that could be exchanged for food and drink at the festival, as well as a map that showed where each fate store would be found on the day itself. These events were always popular and most, if not all, of the people in the area would attend, at least for a while. As part of the preparations, the local women's association volunteered to make the food. They took the time to think about what people had liked in the last few years and they used this to create a list of the best food to have at the festival. There were many dishes on the menu, but the one that was sure to be a firm favourite and that needed to be good and plentiful was Japanese curry. By Saturday the 25th of July 1998 everything was ready. There were tables heaving with food, too much drink, lots of games and prizes to be won. There was music ready to go and competitions for the children. All in all, the festival committee was pleased with how things had gone and they were ready to enjoy the fruits of their labour. As had been predicted, the curry was indeed the most popular dish. It was served to people from a huge cooking pot and thanks to the vouchers people had been given, some, borrowing vouchers from those who couldn't attend, even had second helpings. Others, who couldn't stay long or who weren't hungry but didn't want to miss out, brought containers so they could take their curry home with them and have it later. It really couldn't have been going any better. Until it wasn't going well at all. Not too long after the festival had started, people began to feel unwell, even vomiting and suffering from terrible stomach pains. The committee chairman, Takatoshi Taninaka, was nowhere to be found, but it emerged that his wife discovered him at home, clutching his heart. A doctor at the event determined that the problem had to be food poisoning, but this was no ordinary food poisoning. Some people were so ill they had to be taken to hospital. By the time the initial dust settled on the morning of the next day, the 26th of July, 63 people had been hospitalised. Sadly, four people had died. They were Takatoshi Taninaka, Takaki Tanaka, 16-year-old Miyuki Tori and 10-year-old Hirotaka Hayashi, no relation to Mizumi. When post-mortems were carried out, food poisoning was no longer the culprit. Poisoning of a different kind, however, was. It was arsenic. Of course, the news soon spread across Japan and the news and media outlets started calling it the Wakayama poisoning. There was speculation that this was a terrorist plot, that it was something to do with spies and much more. But why would a criminal choose an affluent but small village like Sonobe to poison people in? It didn't make any sense. The arsenic was determined to have been in powdered form and the police hypothesised that someone could easily have sprinkled this over the food during the festival. After this, however, the investigation stalled and the police were heavily criticised. People were scared, concerned that the same thing could happen to them and their loved ones, and they wanted answers. Finally, a break in the case came. It was discovered that two men had been hospitalised for what was thought at the time to be food poisoning, although traces of arsenic were found in their hair. Where had they been eating before they became unwell? Sonobe. And where specifically? at the Hayashi house. This was bad. Worse was the fact that these men had insurance policies taken out on them. These policies would pay out if they became terribly ill and Masumi was the one who organised them. When one of the men was hospitalised, Masumi was paid 6 million yen thanks to the policy. That's about £40,000 or $52,000. More would come to light. The police discovered another insurance scam perpetrated by Masumi and Kenji Hayashi. In this case, Masumi had been burned when cooking spaghetti. However, on her insurance claim, Masumi stated that the injuries had come from her falling off her bike onto a bonfire. And the deeper the police looked, the more insurance scams they found. Finally, the mystery of how the Hayashis could afford to live in Sonobe was revealed. They had conned their way into the money. The police felt that it must have been 37-year-old Masumi who put the arsenic in the curry at the summer festival. After all, it seemed she had done it before, on a smaller scale, and to add to her guilt, she had taken out insurance policies on a number of different people, 
all of whom were expected to be at the festival that day. It was on this evidence that the police searched the Hayashi home and found arsenic there. Not a normal occurrence, but then Kenji had been in the termite extermination business and would have used arsenic in his line of work. It might therefore be argued that this was a circumstantial piece of evidence, but when a lab analysis was done, the arsenic found in Masumi Hayashi's house was an exact match for the arsenic that had killed four people and made so many more unwell. On top of this, there were witnesses who claimed to have seen Masumi hovering around the curry pot. The pressure on the police to solve the case was growing by the day, but it took until October 1998 for an arrest to be made. This arrest was Masumi and Kenji Hayashi. The charges were related to fraudulent insurance claims. At the same time, they charged Masumi with four counts of murder. Both Masumi and Kenji were found guilty of insurance fraud. Because of this, Kenji was sentenced to six years in prison. Then it was Masumi's turn. Her trial started in May 1999 and it gripped the public. The problem with the case was that it mainly came down to circumstantial evidence. The main points included the matching types of arsenic, the witnesses who saw Masumi in the area of the curry pot, and the history of the insurance fraud that landed two men in hospital. For their part, the defence argued that the arsenic was a common type and that there was every reason to find it in Masumi's home. They also went on to say that the witnesses couldn't be sure they saw Masumi. It might have been her daughter, for example, or someone else entirely. Or maybe it was Masumi. After all, dozens of people went close to the curry pot as it was the most popular dish at the fete. They also suggested that Masumi couldn't have been sure she would hospitalise the right people. So, even if she had insured some of the people at the fate, poisoning the curry wouldn't have guaranteed the results she might have wanted. This gave the prosecution their chance to suggest an alternative motive. Rather than anything to do with insurance, or maybe as well as, this poisoning plot was all about revenge. Having been shunned by the locals and by the Sonobi Women's Society in particular, they alleged that Masumi decided to make them pay. The trial lasted for three years and at the end, Masumi pleaded innocent, but the Japanese court found her guilty of murder and sentenced her to death. Many people to this day still feel that Masumi was innocent, or at least that there was not enough evidence to sentence her to death, but after numerous appeals, the death sentence was upheld. As a sad coda to this story, on the 9th of June 2021, Masumi's 37-year-old daughter jumped off a bridge at Kansai Airport, killing herself and her four-year-old daughter. Her 16-year-old daughter, was found bludgeoned to death earlier the same day. It would seem that the shame of her mother's crime was something she just could not live with. Thank you so much for watching my video. If you enjoyed the content, click the subscribe and like buttons so you can receive more content like this strange story. See you next time.